Good afternoon and welcome to the first part of our program of Lunch and Look at Home, the Nativity in Art. We're so glad to have this opportunity to look at our special exhibition, The Spirit of Bethlehem, The Beam Porcelain Nativity. We wanted an opportunity to share with you as it is installed here in our lobby and um, to look at some of the individual figures within the Bean Porcelain Nativity. And then later we'll switch to a slideshow segment to explore the broader history of the Nativity in Art using our Spirit of Bethlehem as our opening focus point. Uh, the Spirit of Bethlehem is a beautiful 16-figure nativity set by the Bean Porcelain Company, which was founded by Edward Marshall Bean. The um, set was issued between 1979 and 1983. Now at this time, Bean had already passed away, but the company was led by his widow, Helen Bean, who followed her husband's vision and worked with the artisans that he had trained to produce beautiful works of art. The um, nativity came to the Stark Museum as a gift from the estates of John and Sarah Lindsay, and we're very happy to be able to present it as one of our holiday exhibitions. We at the museum enjoy having uh, Christmas holiday exhibitions because it's a way to connect with a broad uh, spectrum of our audience. The celebration of the Christmas holidays is a religious event, but it's also a shared cultural event that is experienced by many, although not all, um, in our contemporary society. And it's a way um, for all of us to make connections. Uh, having the exhibit can be a focal point for um, part of the celebration, and we hope you and your family will use our exhibition to enhance your enjoyment of the holiday spirit. The um, nativity produced by uh, the Beam Company, as I said, is 16 figures presented as a tableau of three-dimensional figures. The Beam Company followed centuries-long traditions of showing the nativity in uh, art and in specifically in the three-dimensional group of individual figures. The um, nativity is significant within the Christian tradition as the presentation of the story of the birth of a savior for the world. And thus it was a, a joyful event it comes to us in a, a season of dark winter in which we can um, express that joy uh, through our own observations. Uh, Beam and other artists drew upon the Christian Bible for the essential telling of the Christmas story. It's found in the Bible in two separate places, the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. And each of those books, each of those gospel books, tells a slightly different version of the story. Uh, and therefore, works of art often combine those elements, as we see in the um, three-dimensional nativity, bringing together the two different accounts, conflating them, um, but uh, uniting the story with one message. Artists like Beam also drew not only upon the story, but on other written sources that evolved through the ages as interpretation of the biblical story and uh, enriched with um, meditations and um, legends that grew up around the story. Um, and then um, in addition, they drew upon other inspiration from works of art, where elements of those stories became visualized and traditions passed down in the works of art. 
So um, Edward Marshall Bean produced the Spirit of Bethlehem in his traditional working um, medium, which was hard paste porcelain. Uh, porcelain is a um, ceramic that um, has um, several major components, and uh, Edward Marshall Bean formulated a, um, an experimental process uh, and formula for producing a hard paste porcelain, and thus he transformed American uh, manufacture of porcelain by uh, increasing its quality and beauty. He primarily uh, worked in uh, a mode of realism. His primary subjects were animals, but he did also do some religious subjects, and quite often in those with those religious subjects, which then his company followed, he produced the works in their unadorned bisque state. Um, the bisque porcelain is uh, the white surface which uh, emerges as the uh, clay is fired. Uh, other works being wood paint to show real realistic effects. Uh, his religious works he primarily left in the white bisque state. I think this gives it a look of, of purity and elegance, and I think it was important for him as, as uh, creating a particular look for the religious works, which um, his studio continued for the most part, although they later would produce uh, painted versions of the Spirit of Bethlehem as well. But I think we're fortunate to have this very elegant and beautiful and an um, ethereal white bisque version of the sculpture. So let's look at some of the individual works, and, and we'll look at them. Uh, the, the Beam Company produced them as several figures annually so that um, purchasers of the nativity set could begin with a, with a three-group figure and add figures each year to uh, expand and tell the entire story. They began with the three primary figures, the Christ child, his mother Mary, and father Joseph. And um, in showing the Christ child, they depicted him placed on a bed of hay. And this, of course, uh, was related to uh, the gospel story in Luke, in which uh, it was told that uh, his mother, a a bear, her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, um, a manger being the, the feeding trough for animals. They had to, um, uh, the birth took place uh, in a stable or a cave, uh, because Mary and Joseph were not able to find a, a place in an inn when they came to Bethlehem where the birth took place. So we see the very humble setting with the uh, bed of hay. In this case, when you, when you come and look at, in the museum, you can peek down and see that it's actually a wicker basket um, that provides the, uh, the trunk. Now, the gospel... Um, said the baby was wrapped in swaddling clothes, or cloths. Um, these were, this was a, a way of protecting the child and giving warmth by wrapping and very tightly. Um, we have a tradition today of the snuggly um, to place the baby. Uh, so in that case, Beam did not, Beam Company did not follow strictly uh, the biblical account. Instead, they drew upon other sources, probably inspired by art, uh, but scholars have traced back representations of the Christ child in the manger shown almost nude and in a more lively pose to uh, a literary source, uh, the, the uh, visions of St. Bridget, who was a uh, 12th century um, visionary 
and uh, she described having a, seeing the Christ child naked and um, glowing, uh, and um, her vision inspired artistic representations. It gives the um, artist, such as the, the Beam Company, a chance for a, a more lively pose, which what I think you can see in general was important to the aesthetic of the Beam nativity. Um, very elegant gestures, very dramatic poses, even within the static formulation of the um, nativity. So here we see the baby Jesus guy kicking his legs, raising his ar arms in, with his hands in a gesture that almost looks like a, a gesture of blessing. He's flanked uh, in our setting by his mother uh, Mary, uh, shown beautifully uh, dressed in a, in a robe with um, wonderful details that look like a medieval book um, manuscript um, border decorations. Uh, she, both Mary and Joseph are shown kneeling because they are shown as uh, adoring and worshiping their child that they know is, is a deity. Um, Mary's often depicted with her hands at a prayer gesture. In this case, uh, they're slightly open, perhaps uh, indicating a movement toward prayer or a movement toward um, her child. Uh, Joseph is shown as a bearded man. He is, um, by tradition, older than Mary, so I think that's one of the details to show the age of um, Joseph. And he carries um, a staff, which was a traditional attribute of uh, Joseph. There was a medieval legend that uh, Joseph was chosen, uh, or signified as chosen among many suitors to be the husband of Mary, when the staff that he carried uh, miraculously uh, flowered or a dove uh, flew down upon it. So um, Joseph's symbol of the uh, staff is ever present. The next three figures to um, be produced by the Bean Porcelain Company were the angels. Uh, in the center, we have the standing angel and to the left. To the left as you face it, the angel of trumpet, and then the lovely kneeling angel who also um, broadly gestures and appears to be singing. Uh, the angel um, comes from the Gospel of um, Luke, and the angel in Christian tradition and theology is a messenger from God. And in the Gospel of Luke, an angel brings a message to um, shepherds about the birth of the Christ child. That, thus, the angel brings news to the shepherds um, and serves in that role as the uh, announcer. Uh, the so that scene is typically called the Annunciation, the announcement to the angels, and we'll, to, the, to the shepherds. And we'll see a version of that later in the uh, slideshow. Uh, the angel tells them that they should go to the, the town of Bethlehem from the, the hills where they are with their sheep and um, worship the uh, Christ child. There's only one angel, and then a host of angels join and sing glory to God. In uh, the Bean Porcelain, we have um, just three angels standing for that host. Now, actually, in the narrative, the angels disappear after they bring the news to the, sh to the um, shepherds, but the angel is so important um, in the story that in nativity scenes, there's almost always one angel and in this case, there's the three that stand for um, the house. The Bean Company only described them um, as standing angel, kneeling angel, and angel with trumpet, um, although they also described them as Neapolitan angels. 
And in that description, in their original marketing, they are indicating one of the sources of inspiration for um, these figures. And I'll talk more about that uh, in the slide segment. The, the angel with the trumpet uh, may refer to um, some uh, presentations of the angel Gabriel, who is mentioned in um, the, uh, the Gospels. But um, in medieval time, he was known for having a trumpet and playing a trumpet. So maybe that's the reason. But it also just gives, I think, a, a narrative element to um, the, the nativity. So the next figures, of course, had to be um, the shepherds. So the next three figures issued by um, Bean Porcelain were the aged shepherd and the young shepherd and a single lamb. Uh, you, when you uh, look at the pieces, you can see that the clothing of the shepherds is very simple and basic. Um, in Christian theology, the uh, shepherds coming to uh, worship the uh, Christ child uh, represent um, the outreach to the um, average person and even the lower classes. Shepherds um, in um, Hebrew times were quite often on the, the bottom of the rung of uh, social classes. And um, they, they, therefore, they play an important role in the nativity story. The um, gospel account doesn't tell how many shepherds came or really describe them in any way. Um, Beam, by doing an aged shepherd and a young shepherd, uh, has representative figures that stand for the different ages. Um, and I think there may be some other intentions in the way the shepherds are shown. The young shepherd is shown holding a lamb, and he's also accompanied by a ram. Um, in uh, Christian theology, uh, the lamb is often a symbol for the, um, for the Christ that, as a sacrif sacrificial animal. Um, the prophet Isaiah in the Hebrew uh, books of the Bible um, described uh, he is a lamb uh, brought to slaughter. And perhaps the young shepherd is bringing a gift to the Christ child, which represents the later sacrifice that um, Christ would make in the Christian um, narrative. The aged shepherd, this uh, kind of this interesting pose, he's bending down, reaching for something, and the, the logical um, piece that he's reaching for is the single figure of the lamb to com com complete that motion. Um, I think this also evokes uh, a later story in the um, Gospels in which both Matthew and Luke tell of a, an instance of, of the adult Jesus telling a parable, a story with a moral, about uh, a shepherd seeking his lost sheep, and that story being uh, a parable that tells about uh, the love of God for all his children, even those who are like the sheep lost. The shepherds then are balanced by the other visitors to the nativity scene, although um, coming from a different gospel and probably not taking place at the same time. That's one reason why uh, the three-dimensional nativities uh, really bring together um, a, a conflation of events. In contrast to the humble shepherds, we have the opulence of the next group of visitors to the nativity scene. The, the three wise men are kings. The three wise men, uh, their story comes from the Gospel of Matthew, who tells of these wise men or magi who come from the east following a star. Now, there's no star uh, represented in, uh, the, as an element in this nativity, 
But interestingly enough, the beautiful robes of the kings have uh, wonderful patterns, and uh, including a number of patterns of star designs. So I hope you have a chance to see the details. Uh, their opulence is indicated by the um, gold detailing on their robes and clothing and the objects they bring. These, these wise men brought gifts. And the Gospel of Matthew uh, does not tell us a great deal of detail about the wise men. Um, but over the centuries, the details have been filled in by many uh, accounts and writers uh, writing on the uh, nativity story and by uh, legends and um, visual representations. Uh, the wise men, the, Matthew describes them only as wise men, uh, but they've become to be considered as well kings. Um, and thus their, their great wealth. Uh, the uh, conflation of uh, kings probably came from interpretations of the prophecies of the prophet Isaiah again. Um, I, Isaiah mentioned kings bearing gifts of gold and frankincense, and that was immediately uh, recognized as relating to the story. So um, the, the I've often been presented as kings, and, and you especially see the wonderful crown on King Melchior. And they've even been given names over the centuries. Um, the um, gold-bearing king is Melchior. The frankincense-bearing king is Gaspar. And the myrrh-bearing king is Balthazar. Uh, the three kings have given uh, opportunities for interpretations of ages and regions, which you'll see in some of the other examples uh, in our slideshow. But uh, the bean porcelain uh, nativity, I think, emphasizes the gifts that each brings um, through that gold detailing on the, in the, um, on the porcelain itself. Um, Melchior brings gold, and in the Christian tradition, the gift of gold shows that the Christ child is um, a, a wealthy king. Gold is a gift suitable for a king. Gaspar brings frankincense and incense. That is a gift appropriate for a priest. So that refers to the priestly nature of um, Christ. And Balthasar brings myrrh, which is also an incense, but uh, it, it can be used as an anointing oil for the dead. And thus it refers to the future sacrificial role of the um, child. The final uh, four figures of the bean nativity are the townspeople the townspeople um, figure of a piper and of a woman with fruit. Now, there's no biblical mention of a piper or, or a woman with fruit. Um, this is an example of the inclusion in, the, in um, nativities of extra figures that often represent the local community. So. Um, in addition to bringing in the, the shepherds as the, the one example of the humble people, the kings representing the entire world um, coming and the, the wor world of wealth and prestige, and then the townspeople re representing the everyday people. And also the donkey and the cow. Um, of course, the, uh, the, the scene took place adjacent to a manger, a food trough, so logically they're going to be animals. But there's no mention of um, a donkey and a cow in the gospel stories, either Matthew or um, Luke, but they are a predominant element in nativity scenes and uh, particularly in uh, 
um, the three-dimensional ones. Uh, and again, um, scholars have traced their specific inclusion back to a meditation from the prophet Isaiah, where he said, uh, an ox knows his master and the um, ass his master's crib, indicating that even the animals would know the significance of, of the birth. And so an ass and an ox are always included in the nativity scenes, and they were among the final figures for the um, bean porcelain nativity. So in this look at um, the exhibition and the individual pieces, I hope we've seen some of the ways that uh, the Bean Company drew on uh, traditions, uh, but as well added their own uh, unique interpretation to uh, the story of the birth of the child. Okay. Now we'll look at um, other examples and the history of the nativity in art and some of the um, ways that this uh, particular nativity came to be. Um, I, I would like to look a little bit at the origins of the nativity. Uh, quite often, the, in the historical accounts of nativity sets, the, it is cited that St. Francis of Assisi helped to originate this idea uh, 12th and the uh, 13th century. Uh, this wonderful uh, friar and um, uh, founder of the Franciscan order in 1223, it was reported that he wanted to spark uh, devotion uh, among the people, and he got permission from the Pope to uh, revive the idea of a, a drama of the uh, birth of the Christ child. And in the town of Greccio, he set up an, a manger with a child, probably a doll, and a real ox and ass. And that was seen as um, providing devotion for the people. Uh, art historical scholars um, point out that this tradition that St. Francis has started was very important for liturgical dramas, but perhaps was not the direct association for representations of the nativity in uh, the visual arts. The uh, representation of nativity scenes in uh, visual arts appear both in religious art and public worship settings, such as churches, and also in private devotions. They date back, uh, as far as scholars can find, to about the fourth century, which was the era in which the Christian church was really strongly evolving. Uh, they appear in um, ecclesiastical settings, but also some personal. Um, the example I'm showing you is, is uh, later. This is a a 12th century carving of the uh, nativity, uh, but it shows the importance of including it with religious objects. I want to draw your attention. Here are the ubiquitous ox and ass looking on uh, the child who is shown there swaddled. And then uh, in the lower register, the Mary and Joseph. Mary is shown reclining on a couch. Joseph is shown sleeping. Um, which is often a characterization of Joseph. Uh, this relates to stories of, in the Bible of uh, Joseph having an angel appear to him while he slept uh, a couple of times once, telling him it, to marry Mary, and later after the birth of the child to flee to Egypt. So we have um, that association with the sleeping Joseph, um, but it's also been seen as a very human element, the um, Joseph falling asleep after the uh, birth of the, the child. Um, the uh, scenes of, around the birth also appear in altarpieces, which were a large uh, painted representations uh, in churches. This is a Netherlandish artist, Hertentot St. Jans, who uh, depicted the adoration of the Magi. And so we see our three kings here. We see that they are shown in different ages, one an older man, one a middle-aged man, and one a younger man. And they're shown to represent different regions uh, that they come from. And notice that Balthazar is 
um, black. He is shown as coming from the region of Africa. And in this way, the kings represented the entire world being uh, coming to adore the Christ child. And in a, a beautiful painting in the background are shown the kings arriving uh, in their, with their entourages from all the different locations. The um, Christian story also appears in stained glass, and I wanted to show a couple of examples from our local community. Uh, here is the Holy Family in the First Presbyterian Church here in Orange, Texas. It was made by the J.R. Lamb Studios, and it represents uh, really as well the um, adoration of the shepherds. We see again the idea of the different ages of the shepherd. We see a young shepherd uh, with, uh, showing with great emotion in his hand gestures. And, uh, then we see the older shepherd looking on. And we also have included a woman and a child who brings the sheep. So uh, this painting of the adoration of the shepherds is particularly inclusive in showing not only the, uh, the shepherds uh, in different ages, but including women and children. This um, representation in stained glass is based on a painting, and I'm grateful to uh, Kyle Hood of the Presbyterian Church and other uh, team members there for doing uh, research and identifying the uh, artist, Martin Feuerstein. And I was able to locate uh, the painting that Feuerstein produced that inspired the stained glass. Uh, this is his painting of the Adoration of the Shepherds, which is in a church in uh, Mammenheim, which is in Alsace in France. And Feuerstein was a German painter who was um, a late member of a group of artists who uh, were associated around the idea of bringing spirituality back to art artistic expressions. Uh, they felt that uh, art in their period had become too classical and had gotten away from its uh, religious founding, and they wanted to bring that back into art. And Feuerstein uh, was an inherent of that uh, following uh, late in his life, and they called themselves the Nazarenes, or actually they, they, that name was applied to them by those who kind of mocked the, the piety of these artists. And, uh, but they adapted that and saw it as a, a badge of honor in what essence. Feuerstein shows the uh, shepherds and he shows them uh, coming to the Holy Family, notice that Mary is uh, wrapping or unwrapping the child to present it for their adoration. Feuerstein's art was especially influential because, as well, uh, the same scene inspired the stained glass representation that is in the First United Methodist Church in Orange, uh, another beautiful rendition of this story. Um, and um, it was common at that time for the stained glass companies to draw upon European art for um, the scenes that would then be translated into stained glass for American churches. And thanks to um, Beverly Millsap at the First Methodist Church who did the research on um, the stained glass windows in that church. Those are the public uh, versions, but private devotions uh, involving the Christmas story were also very important. And those were often conveyed through books of hours, which were prayer books that were especially prominent in the uh, medieval period. And uh, lay people, people um, who were average members of the church, would use these prayer books to guide them through their daily round of prayers. And there followed a, a set um, De designation of scenes that accompanied uh, a prayer at each time of day. Uh, so we have the uh, nativity was one of the prayers, and I have two examples here from uh, uh, French nativities, one by Jean Bordichon and one uh, by a combination of artists. And you notice in this nativity, it is the birth of Mary 
and Joseph with the Christ child. Notice in the Bordeshan one on the left that the um, manger is a, a wicker basket like form with the child on uh, the bed of hay. And we have the ox and the ass, ass peering there uh, directly uh, behind the manger. And then on, on the right, uh, Christ is now shown, uh, the Christ child is shown uh, rather regally on a red bed um, or couch, uh, veering a little bit from the uh, biblical setting, uh, but um, putting it in the stable and giving it a more royal element. The, um, another of the uh, daily prayers was done with the illustration to the Annunciation to the Shepherds, and I showed two uh, from our books of ours here at the museum, another one from uh, Bordichon, and uh, a Flemish one. And you'll notice that shepherds are in common clothing um, and something that would have been um, recognizable to the medieval audience. So that's a moment in which they can identify with the figures of the shepherds. And notice that also each one of these uh, illustrations includes a shepherd who has a bagpipe. Uh, the bagpipe in medieval times was supposedly played by shepherds uh, when they were in their fields as a way of calming the uh, sheep and so the artist of books of hours incorporated that uh, element into their representations of the shepherds and i think that's possibly what specifically in, uh, influenced the bean porcelain company to include a bagpiper not necessarily as a shepherd, but as one of the townspeople. But they have um, the tradition from the Books of Hours and other representations of the shepherds. And then finally, the Books of Hours would include the um, adoration of the Magi, here too with the three kings. Um, these showing the different ages of the uh, kings and especially the, the very royal trappings and then the beautiful um, gifts that the that they brought. Uh, th those were private devotions. So then how do we move to the three-dimensional private um, nativity sets that we are, are so familiar with from the bean porcelain and from our own experiences? Well, art historians have um, traced um, the first uh, nativity set that was a three-dimensional um, miniature version that was established in a church at Christmas time. Drawing that distinction that these are done for as part of the celebration of the uh, Christmas event and uh, the earliest that can be documented goes back to 1567 1562 rather uh, a Jesuit and a Jesuit church in Prague, now Czechoslovakia. And the Jesuit order in the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church um, became especially identified with the use of the nativity sets or creches, using the French word for crib, um, was a common way of describing these nativity sets to uh, distinguish them from uh, representations in painting. Um, the Jesuits uh, used them in their churches and also as missionaries. And there's an account in um, 1642 um, of a Jesuit missionary who had gone to Canada and wrote back that he had had success using creches to uh, teach Native Americans in Canada about the Christmas story. So the uh, custom of having three-dimensional sets grew uh, particularly in Southern Europe and um, spread in the uh, 16th and 17th and then had an especial flowering in the 18th century in the Kingdom of Naples, which is now part of Italy, but um, at that time was its own kingdom. Uh, it took off, I think, both from um, pri as a private devotion um, from royalty, the uh, Duchess of Amalfi in um, 1567 re was recorded as having a set of nativity figures that numbered up to 116 figures. 
I, the um, nativity passion was also adopted by kings of uh, Naples, and thus I think it, it became a trend um, and it was widely practiced in Naples. And of course, the adjective for Naples is Neapolitan. So um, I think that the beams in noting the um, the angels as Neapolitan angels are tying themselves to the tradition of representation of um, creches as they were well known and widely represented in Naples. Uh, this beautiful set is in the Cleveland uh, Museum of Art. And one of the most amazing ones is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. You can see two of the figures here. You can see the very elaborate, they were terracotta heads with wooden bodies and actual cloth figures. The, uh, and the Naples sets were known for having many, many additional figures bringing in townspeople and tradespeople. And here is a man with a basket of fruit. Um, and thus, I think this tradition influenced the bean porcelain, including the woman with a basket of fruit that we saw in our um, porcelain nativity. Uh, the uh, the uh, nativity followed those traditions of Naples, but you can see it's much more simplified. It doesn't, it is of course porcelain rather than using the um, actual cloth. Uh, Edward Marshall Beam uh, founded the company, was known for uh, his representations of animals. He did a wonderful series of birds, and those were usually painted to be very realistic. When he did a few religious figures, those were the ones that he left, like the Madonna and the Pieta, in the pure white. It was, his, I think, his widow, or his wife, um, Helen Beam, who was conventionally religious. He, from what I read, is, was not. He was not a church girl. She was. I think she influenced him to begin the series of religious figures. And then when she inherited the company and led it, she um, influenced the artisans to produce figures like the nativity. We see her working here with um, the, some of the artisans. And that she, she was responsible for bringing forth the nativity and making it part of the uh, Christmas celebration, uh, something that many of us do. Uh, we respond both to the beauty of the scenes, but there's also something playful. Um, nativity scenes are somewhat like a doll's house. And I think it, it uh, responds to uh, several emotions. And it's one reason that many of us collect and um, treasure the nativity scenes that we have personally. Our education department has started a Facebook post where you can um, post a, a picture of your nativity scene and include it with some of your comments about uh, your special uh, adherence to the nativity tradition. These are two from our family. One, um, uh, the Lorraine Brock made nativity and one, um, from a Southwestern Native American tradition by uh, Santa Clara Pueblo uh, Potters. And I, I hope that um, this will inspire you to participate and enjoy the holiday season uh, from your own perspective. Um, before we conclude, uh, I wanna ask if there are any more questions concerning the nativity. Well, Sarah, one question that popped up in the chat while we were, um, while you were hearing your slides was uh, Dina asked if there were any additional figures to our nativity set. And I told her, I believe our set is complete, though, um, as you mentioned, he did do some other religious figures. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, um, there may have been some um, additional figures that were later produced um, after Helen Beam um, sold the company to another um, uh, person. Uh, that's when they did a painted version. And the, one of the, the painted version was presented by the then owner to one of the popes. So there is a beam uh, porcelain nativity in the papal collections, um, but it, it is a, a painted version. 
Uh, most of the figures that Edward Marshall Beam made were those uh, Madonnas. He did um, a, he did a Saint Francis, and he did um, a, a few other figures for private commissions. Any other questions? You have a question in the comments, or you can um, you can unmute yourself to ask a question. Um, let's see here. Robert, I'm looking at your question. Was the colored painted? So, um, Sarah, on the, the colored um, yes, nativity, been, was hand painted, not glazed? Um, yes, and um, Edward Marshall Beam did not like glazes. Um, they would be hand painted and still have more of a matte texture. He felt the shiny glazes um, interfered with the perception of the, of his, of the details. Um, you know, they're reflective. And uh, that was very much his, uh, uh, his aesthetic approach. Um, another question's popped in, and Sarah, you get this one a lot. Is there any relationship between um, Sarah Bame and Edward Marshall Beam? No. Um, as far as we know, you know, the, the name goes back to, to Germany and was relatively common there, um, but no direct relationship that I know of. I certainly have not inherited a beam nativity <laughs> from the family tradition. Um, Susie Bass, I see a question from you, and I'm so sorry I missed it. Um, she wanted to know, Sarah, how many of the sets were created? Do we know in total how many sets? No. Uh, this is uh, what's called in the uh, beam and, and many other um, multiple producers an open set. So they produced as many as they could sell basically. And probably since they've sold them uh, in increments, there may be more Jesus, Jesus and Mary and Joseph than there are townspeople. Um, so it, perhaps there are, there is a museum in the, the Midwest that is supposed to have acquired the Beam um, records. So there may be information there, but um, it's, it's not available now. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Susie, thank you so much for your question. Well, I think at this time we wanna, um, we said we were gonna go to one o'clock. I'm gonna stay on for a little bit longer, but I don't want to keep you longer than we asked. Thank you again for joining us and thank you for your patience with us as we dealt with some technology issues. Um, we wish you the happiest of holidays. I also wanna give a quick reminder that um, our um, colleagues from the WH Stark House are doing a lunch and learn next week at noon on the history of the American Santa. That is from 12 to 1 p.m. Um, it's gonna be a great program so we hope that you will join us if you can for that you can find that link um, at the Stark Cultural Venues website or on our Facebook it's been shared there so I'm seeing a couple people saying they are already signed up um, so thank you again have a happy holidays and we look forward to seeing you either at our next online virtual program or here at the museum soon